All right, so this is Fall Frustration, the Seasonal Weed and Turf Pest Guide. Let's go ahead and get started here. Brief introductions. <laughs> so my name is Will, I'm one of the yard advisors here at Sunday. I got my Bachelor's of Science in Environmental and Sustainability Sciences from Cornell University and spent my summers uh, in between high school and then after college uh, working on a small vegetable farm. So excited to be able to chat with you all about lawns. And we'll be discussing, or I'll specifically be uh, chatting about some of the um, turf grass pests we may see uh, and uh, provide a brief overview of repair while Yvonne is going to be chatting a bit more about weed control and she's our weed expert. So I'll pass it over to her. <laughs> hey y'all, my name is Ivana. I am from Texas. I, was, I got my Bachelor of Science at Texas State University um, majoring in horticulture. Um, I've been a professional landscaper, mostly on the growing plant side, but I've done a lot of planting and maintaining um, various landscape plants and grasses as well. Um, so I'll be here to chat about more plants, just the ones you don't want instead of the ones you want. So tonight, uh, our webinar is going to be broken into five primary sections. So the first uh, um, section is going to be Sunday's approach to lawn care. So for anyone who attended our order of operations webinar earlier this season, this is essentially revisiting what does Sunday's uh, approach to lawn care consist of? How does it differ um, from your conventional approach, if you will, right? It's a good time to just circle back on that and make sure that this is fresh in our minds. Secondly, we'll tackle weeds and general uh, practices in, or general tips in terms of weed control, but then we'll also dive into uh, specific indicator weeds. So there are certain weeds which can be or can indicate a certain factor regarding the environment. So if we're able to consider why are these weeds able to take hold, specific weeds may be able to provide uh, certain clues for us. Fourthly, we'll chat about turf grass pests, so for example, grubs, uh, and how to minimize their presence moving forward. And then lastly, we'll give a very brief overview of essentially how to repair these areas, what um, recovery is going to look like as the temps start to drop. But like I said, Thursday's webinar is going to expand or essentially pick up where this webinar leaves off tonight. So circling back to Sunday's approach to lawn care. Um, so. During the order of operations webinar, we essentially broke this down into the first step uh, Sunday always focuses on is essentially considering the environment, right? So if we were to break lawn care into three separate practices, if you will, or three separate factors, um, they would be prioritizing cultural practices, fertilizing, and then spot treating weeds as needed, right? And so this is different from your conventional approach of potentially uh, relying upon fertilizers being one of your primary factors or um, a pre-emergent herbicide, for example. I know that we had a significant number of questions come through as part of the registration process asking um, how to control weeds, how do we prevent weeds, uh, if we are moving away from a pre-emergent, what the best practices are. So um, that is a key factor to keep in mind that Sunday, and Ivana, I'm stealing a bit of your spotlight here. So <laughs> um, Sunday does take an IPM or integrated pest management approach to, to weed control. So essentially, if we're looking to modify the environment to prevent the weeds from appearing while also maximizing grass growth, essentially tackling both at the same time, that's our, our focus. But Ivana is going to expand upon much better than I will. <laughs> um, so when we're considering cultural practices, uh, we had a couple of questions regarding um, growing grass under trees. So this is a great example of uh, prioritizing your cultural practices and essentially considering the environment, right? So underneath the tree, we may uh, be dealing with shade as being the primary limiting factor, right? So we may want to consider uh, transitioning to a different grass type. So potentially a fine fescue mix. Uh, if we're um, if we have a tall fescue or a bluegrass uh, mix within the lawn, um, we may also want to chat about our watering schedule just to make sure that we're taking into consideration the competition for resources with the tree there, uh, but also making sure that we're not providing so much water um, that with uh, along with the shade, essentially we're uh, providing too moist of an environment, right? And then we could run into potential disease concerns. So the first step we have here from a cultural perspective um, or cultural practices perspective is maintaining that turf density. So considering why the grass may start to thin out or may not be taking in some areas. So uh, too much shade, too much sun exposure, uh, too much water, too little water, uh, too much water, we could start to run into disease concerns, too little, we could be uh, starting to see drought stress. Um, 
could also consider uh, if the grass is right next to a sidewalk, for example, that pavement may be radiating heat uh, to the surrounding turf and stressing it, right? So uh, maintaining that turf density and considering the environment is crucial. Secondly, from a watering perspective, uh, making sure that we are following a deepened and frequent watering schedule. Um, I will say that growing up near Buffalo, <laughs> if I said that we watered the lawn regularly uh, throughout the summer, I'd be lying. <laughs> um, but what we tend to see is, especially for the Northeast, if we're able to make sure that we're providing enough water, but not um, so much that it's excessive, the majority of lawn issues are, are resolved right? and we're able to get grass established. So watering is a crucial um, component um, for lawn care, especially as we head into the fall uh, and considering we're exiting the summer, right? So we won't have to be pro providing quite as much water. From a mowing perspective, as silly as it sounds, mowing can be um, a stressor, right? If we're removing too much of the grass blade per cut uh, or mowing too short, we can certainly see the grass begin to yellow a bit, and that can also open up the turf canopy a bit and lead to an increase in the number of weeds. And finally, amending the soil is certainly uh, crucial as well. So uh, whether it be a, a pH amendment, right? So if we have a very acidic uh, soil, potentially uh, incorporating lime, right? Or if we have a very alkaline soil, we could discuss uh, sulfur treatments, for example, um, or adding a bit of compost. Uh, we can also consider if we have a very low organic matter um, percentage, the nutrient pouches are going to help to a certain extent, but if we're able to modify the underlying soil, that will expedite your results um, significantly. So I always consider for uh, what is the underlying soil. If we have very low organic matter, we're going to have very limited water retention, nutrient retention, nutrient availability, et cetera. So uh, that's a critical uh, component to consider, which we'll expand upon in Thursday's webinar. Secondly, like I said, fertilizing is still a, a key component of Sunday's approach to lawn care, but not necessarily as uh, crucial as uh, with a conventional approach. And then finally, like we discussed from a weed control perspective, and, and as Ivana will expand upon, uh, we are providing a pre-emergent, right? So our focus is with Dandelion Doom and Weed Warrior to spot treat weeds as needed. And if we're able to rely upon the turf to crowd out these weeds um, and consider why any weeds are able to take hold, we'll be in a position to be able to spot treat. We won't have um, so many weeds that we're overwhelmed with the, the spot treatment. <clears throat> yeah, so I just wanted to chat a little bit about you know, why they're there, you know, how to remove them, that kind of thing. A lot of weeds are opportunists, you know, they see an empty spot, they take it, you know, there's not much more than that. There are some that I'll get into in the next slide um, that will um, will still pop up as an opportunist, but if you start seeing a lot of them, if your lawn's overrun with one kind of weed, that's usually an indicator weed. That's usually one that we kind of want to take a look at, um, see, you know, what it is, what environment it's in, that kind of thing. Um, but this so far is just it right now for general weed control. Um, so like Will mentioned earlier, following an IPM approach to weeds, and that's just making sure, you know, you're taking stock of your lawn, um, removing them physically if you can. I know it, it sucks, you know, but a lot of times it's going to be the fastest, easiest, best way to get them out of there. Um, there are ones you don't want to um, hand pull, and that would be something like nuts edge. It has little bulbs um, under the soil that if you pull that weed, those two will come up and be two new weeds. So um, I would say physical removal is always my first thought, um, and then you can kind of go into you know, if that doesn't work, what else can we do? Um, another thing to keep in mind would be mowing high and often. Um, this comes with a little bit of an asterisk because some grasses don't like to be mowed as high, um, but for the purposes of, for now, you know, with only cool season grasses, um, mowing high is generally a lot healthier for your grass um, just because it helps it retain water, retain nutrients, protect that soil, um, protect the grass canopy a little bit. Um, it helps with um, avoiding erosion and evaporation from the soil as well. Um, but with the added benefit of crowding out a lot of different weeds. So there's some weeds that lie very low um, and that can be kind of an indication that you're mowing too too low if you start to see those. So something like a spurge, um, a lot of times clover, um, if you mow a little bit higher, those guys will kind of recede a little bit um, just because they're not getting all of the sun that they need. Um, another thing would be as you're mowing, if you're having a lot of weeds flowering, you know, if you see some chickweed in that middle picture, it's got those flowers, the clover on the left also has flowers, anything with a flower or a seed head. Um, if you see those in your lawn, I would recommend bagging your clippings as you mow. And that would just be to take out any of those seeds, keep them from germinating in your lawn. Um, some weeds will spread just by propagation or asexual propagation, meaning if you just throw a piece of it somewhere, it'll start to grow. Um, so it'll also prevent that as well. It'll prevent that spread um, from the mowing. So you can just dispose those clippings afterward. You can compost them, but just removing them from your lawn 
um, will be helpful in just keeping them from coming back. The next thing, and this kind of goes into the density and the height of your grass, would be to improve um, the grass density there. So overseeding regularly, I would say at least once a year until you get most of those weeds under control is going to be one of the best ways um, to keep your lawn weed free going into you know future seasons. So I would say this fall should be a great time to overseed. I know this spring was not a great time to overseed. So if you didn't get a lot of good germination this year, um, that's just because the weather was not right, basically. Um, so I would focus on a heavy overseed this uh, this fall. If you don't know your grass type, um, cool season grasses do mix very well. But if you want a specific grass, if you want your grass to be homogenous, um, feel free to send us a picture. I know there's some apps out there for IDing that kind of thing. Um, but I would just make sure to get some seed down in the fall. Um, seeding in the fall also helps because it will um, prevent a lot of spring weeds from coming up. So you'll start to see a lot of things coming up in the spring. You can Im improve, you know, your chances of not having to deal with them by just a heavy overseed in the fall. The next would be to fertilize appropriately. So that would just be making sure you're not giving your lawn too much fertilizer because that will actually weaken your grass over time um, and allow kind of a long bendy sort of growth that allows for more weed growth. Um, it would also help a lot of weeds come up um, that might be feeding on the excess nutrients there. Um, but on the other side, you know, making sure you are giving your lawn something. So some soils aren't um, fertile enough to really sustain your grass as well as it would like. Um, so that's when a lot of clover will come in. Clover really likes lawns that are a little bit lower in nitrogen. Um, so just making sure that you're giving it something, you know, your grass does need a little bit of a boost. Uh, so just making sure a little bit of a schedule um, will help keep some of those weeds that really enjoy um, less nutrient dense conditions. Something like a spurge as well, really likes um, soils that don't have a lot of nutrients in them. And of course the last part would be um, spot treating. So if you're doing all these practices, you know, you're maintaining your lawn, it is kind of an uphill battle. So if you've got a very weedy lawn, you know, this will take a little bit. Um, but once you've done all of these, as you're continuing to do these, um, spot treating with an herbicide will be really helpful. I like to do this um, right after mowing because the weeds are already damaged. Um, and usually, you know, with weeds like chickweed here and clover, dandelions, that kind of thing, um, you can use our selective herbicide, dandelion doom. That is a broadleaf herbicide. It will only harm broadleaf weeds. It won't harm your grass. Um, if you have a lot of grassy weeds like crabgrass or quackgrass, that kind of thing, um, you can use our Reed Warrior. Uh, just know that it will also damage your turf grass. So that's something that I really only suggest using um, if you're planning on overseeding soon after. So temperatures are starting to be a little bit nicer, you know, for Will, it's getting kind of seeding time. Um, I would go ahead and if you wanted to use that Weed Warrior on those grassy weeds, just know it will harm the turf grass around it. Um, but then right after that, you know, a week or two, follow up with a heavy overseed um, and that will prevent anything else from growing in its stead. All right, indicator weeds. And before I get started on a lot of these, I did want to touch on one thing really quickly, and that is just tree saplings. So they're not technically a weed, but, you know, they behave like one. Um, a lot of people see them. There's not a lot of info out there um, as far as what to do with them. These are something that um, it might seem like a lot of them are germ germinating from seed around your tree, um, but some of them are actually going to be attached to the tree roots. And this is why I highly discourage using any herbicides on any tree saplings around your yard. Uh, we really just wanna make sure to protect that tree. We don't wanna damage it by sending an herbicide through those tree saplings and then back into the roots and then taking it up in that main tree. So if you're getting a lot of tree saplings, I found the best way to kind of combat these is just to mow often. You don't need to mow low, you know, mowing high is still encouraged, um, but by mowing often, you're repeatedly damaging the one terminal point of the tree sapling. It's not like grass where it can get cut repeatedly. It really does set that tree sapling back and injure it, um, and over time, it will start to die. Um, I don't know if any of you have live oaks. I have quite a few. They make a lot of saplings, um, but by repeatedly mowing, I've gotten them down to a very manageable level. So just a quick note there. Moving on to indicator weeds. Um, there are a few shown here. Um, these are kind of some of the usual suspects. Uh, something, you know, like a spurge on the bottom, crabgrass, the bigger one, um, nut sedge there right above the spurge, that kind of thing. Um, there are a few causes and knowing which ones kind of go with which cause will be really helpful in how you can kind of proceed. So for a lot of them, um, too much moisture will be an indication. So something like a nut sedge or a dollar weed. Um, nut sedge is kind of both too much and too little, but I'll get into that in a second. Um, a dollar weed, um, creeping Charlie, African violet, sorry, 
wild violets, like grow African violets, um, that kind of thing, they really enjoy a lot of moisture. So just if you're seeing a lot of these, um, it might be a multiple factors, but this would be kind of an indication that we want to cut down on the watering just a little bit. Um, as far as too little moisture, that would be something like spurge um, or on the flip side, kind of a, not a too much or too little moisture, but too often. Um, that would be crabgrass as well. So crabgrass really likes some shallow, frequent waterings. Um, and if you are watering your lawn, then that would be an indication to me to kind of cut back on the frequency, water a little bit more deeply, you know, add some time into the existing um, schedule, but then take one of the days off, basically. This isn't always um, for indicator weeds. They aren't always an indication something's wrong. So if you do just have a few crabgrass here and there, probably don't need to modify your watering schedule. But if it's something that's taking over, that's kind of when you want to kind of take stock of your conditions. Um, if you have excess shade, you'll start to see a lot of wild violets, some creeping Charlie, um, things like that. I think dollar rate also like shade. Uh, for these, you know, if you can open up the canopy a little bit of your trees, that's great, but I don't have money for an arborist. I don't know if you guys do. Um, so instead of that, I would just look at planting some more shade tolerant grasses. Like Will mentioned, you might need to be, even need to switch to, you know, an ornamental um, ground cover around the tree. Um, something maybe not in English ivy because it's a little invasive, but something like that where it can kind of creep, maybe like a purple heart vine um, and tolerate that shade better than maybe the grass can. And then along with the nut sedge, the tricky too much or too little moisture weed, um, compaction is um, a pretty good, uh, or nut sedge is a pretty good indication that you might have some compaction in your lawn. Um, this is where, you know, too much foot traffic or just the soil composition, something about your lawn, the soil starts to kind of um, get beaten down and more compacted, a little bit tighter. Uh, it's a lot harder for water and air um, to penetrate and get to the roots. Nut sedge really likes a compact soil. So if you're starting to see a ton of nut sedge, um, especially if you see it in one general area, uh, Reno, the nut sedge is the one straight in the middle. Um, it's with the kind of yellowy things poking out, kind of like a firework. Um, that's the flower. Um, and you'll see it in your lawn because it's very glossy. Um, it's kind of sticks out like a store thumb. It's very like glossy, taller grass. Um, growing out of the middle of your of your lawn there. Um, but yeah, it really enjoys compacted soils. It likes having that tight texture there. So that's always an indication um, that you just want to maybe aerate if you can, uh, maybe halt foot traffic there for just a little bit. Um, but aeration is probably going to be the best way to break up that soil. Keep a little bit more open, keep that nut sedge from coming back. And yeah, so I mentioned the nut sedge. Spurge, you know, it really enjoys drier, hotter, um, less nutrient rich conditions. So if I see a lot of spurge, that's an indication to me that we need to change up our watering a little bit and probably add a little bit of organic matter to the soil as well. Uh, so for spurge, that would either indicate that we need to water a little bit more deeply um, or we need to add an extra watering um, time onto our system. So, you know, you might increase the watering time first and then if it looks like it's still, you know, a huge issue and you've done everything else, then you can add another day on. Um, but usually for spurge, my main goal is to amend the soil a little bit because that's going to be the best way to keep it from coming back. Um, so top dressing, uh, either in fall or spring, is going to be my favorite thing to do. I mean, it's my favorite thing anyway, um, but it is going to help kind of control that crazy amount of spurge you're getting. Um, you can do this uh, right before seeding. It's actually really great to pair top dressing with overseeding, but we'll touch on that um, in a little bit as well. Um, and then the last thing with spurge, I would say my favorite thing to do with spurge is to hand pull it. Um, I had to pull it a lot when I worked in a nursery, so it's kind of just something I enjoy doing, but I would say wear gloves um, if you're going to be pulling spurge because it's possible um, that it will irritate your skin. So like I mentioned, you know, address your soil issues if it's something that needs to be addressed. You know, if you've got a lot of compaction, aerate. Um, if you've got a little bit of organic matter, you need more, you know, and go and top dress. Um, if you've got a too high or too low pH, that could be, you know, an issue. So like Will mentioned, adding gypsum or sulfur, um, making sure we establish healthy watering practices. So adding a watering if we're seeing a lot of, you know, um, spurge or crabgrass, um, and then watering a bit more deeply if we need to as well. Um, fertilizing on a schedule will be really helpful to kind of give your grass a timeline, let it know that it doesn't need to be stressed because more stuff is coming and it'll help keep some other weeds at bay. Um, and then limiting shade if you can. Again, it's always kind of a hard one to deal with, um, but if you can limit some shade, that would be helpful. I see we have a question. I'm gonna take a quick drink. Right. And Ivana, I'll uh, jump in here for just a second as well. <laughs> so Rose, we've got um, less than 10 minutes left. Ooh. So we will Sorry. do our best um, to stick to the, the time limit. But if we do run over, like we said, we'll be sending out the recording if you're <laughs> unable to stay. So 
do have a couple of great questions. So we do want to tackle those here. Um, yeah. So I see that we have a question about if our clover is good or bad for tall fescue and if the Zamdelin doom help kill it. So dandelion doom does help kill clover. Um, if it's a large patch, you might need to repeat applications because a lot of times it gets really situated where it is um, and doesn't really want to leave. Um, I will say that clover, it kind of depends on what you're looking for. Um, I would say that clover is great for tall fescue because it adds nitrogen to the soil. Um, it helps actually change nitrogen from something that the plants can't take up to something they can. So it does benefit tall fescue in that way. And I think it's cute. Um, but if you don't like, you know, the look of the two, if you just want it gone, dandelion doom can help you out with that. Um, and then as far as the best way to tackle weeds and flower beds, um, it does depend on what you're growing there. It's a little bit difficult to recommend spraying anything since a lot of ornamental plants are broadleaf plants. Um, but I will say the best way, if you are going to be spraying any sort of herbicide, is just to grab a strip of cardboard, um, hold it you know, over the area you're spraying to protect all of the plants around it from overspray. Um, and you can do that you know, with um, Weed Warrior or Dandelion Doom. As far as keeping them from coming back, um, I would just make sure that you've got a good border around it. You know, If you can hammer in some of that metal landscaping border, that can help as well. I see Walter asked about using Epsom salt and vinegar for ridding a lot of creeping Charlie. I would stay away from Epsom salt for now. Um, I know it's something that's been pretty popular in gardening um, circles, which is great. I just don't have a lot of information on it yet and I don't wanna lead anybody astray. Um, so for now, I wouldn't use Epsom salt. I would probably eliminate that. I will say that regular distilled white vinegar um, can be helpful and shouldn't harm your grass as much as you know any other herbicide would. Um, so I would just be careful um, when applying it, you know, try a small area first and see uh, how your how your lawns respond to it. And it looks like Walter did note that he had tried dandelion doom um, for the creeping Charlie, but it didn't seem to, to make a difference. So um, I will say that creeping Charlie is one of the weeds that we would recommend dandelion doom for, right? So depending on how um, prevalent it is, right? My focus would be if we could consider a second application, right? Um, sometimes, depending on how established the weed is, it may take more than one application to, to knock it back and making sure that we're using it as a spot treatment, right? Just making sure that we have the, the optimal concentration. Um, but yeah. yeah, and that's something too, you know, if you're trying some an herbicide that's rated for a plant and it's just not doing the trick, that's usually when I look to modifying the environment if we can, you know, if you can get a little bit less shady, if you can give that area a little bit moist, little bit less moisture, that kind of thing. Um, a lot of times if a weed's just that hard to kill, it means that it just really likes where it is and you're going to have to either go nuclear, hand pull it, or, you know, try to modify the environment a little bit. And Mark, I believe ground ivy is the same as creeping Charlie, um, but if I'm wrong, let me know, but that would be the same thing, you know, limit shade, uh, limit moisture. Um, and then if you can hand pull it, a lot of times it comes up all together. So I end up just yanking it. Um, but yeah. Perfect. And let's see. And Cliff, how is Sunday's weed control different than the big box store offerings? Really great question. Um, so it is a very broad overview, right? Dandelion dooms the selective herbicide. Primary active ingredient is iron, um, whereas Weed Warrior is essentially an organic uh Moni itself, right, Yvonne? Sorry, the, yes, the herbicidal soap, weed warrior is. Um, so general overview there, right, depending on what you're looking for from a third-party perspective can vary. Uh, I will say also that one of the key differences is that there isn't a pre-emergent included with Sunday's herbicides, right? So there's nothing uh, being included to actively inhibit seed germination. That's why there's such a heavy emphasis on um, seeing law and maintaining that turf density. And then I see that Abhimanyu had another question um, about some weeds. They have a lot growing on the sidewalk because of a lot of heat reflection. Um, I will say for those areas that are a little bit smaller that get a lot of that radiant heat, um, you will just have to baby them a little bit more. So just going out there, maybe adding an additional hand watering, making sure you're watering more deeply, um, adding a little bit more compost if you can, that kind of thing. Um, and that will kind of help just sweeten the area a lot more to make it a little bit easier um, to make it a good place to grow grass. All right, so transitioning to pests here. Um, so from a turf 
pest perspective, or I would say the primary pests which we tend to um, encounter the most further north are grub or uh, would be grubs, right? Uh, there certainly are other pests we would consider. So, for example, um, army worms, uh, sod webworms, but typically a little less common than we would expect uh, for further south, right? And similarly, chinch bugs, while certainly possible for the north, typically uh, a more common pest further south. So um, from a turf pest perspective, I would really prioritize or really place a heavy emphasis on grubs. And so when we're looking for pest damage, what I'm looking for essentially uh, any abnormal or irregular portions of uh, grass beginning to develop in the lawn, right? And Typically, I would say the majority of these patches begin to develop right around the summertime. So there are a number of factors which we can uh, consider. It could be drought stress, could be heat stress, could be turf pest, um, et cetera, right? But if it seems like um, these areas don't align with any of these other factors, to a certain extent, some may be able uh, to essentially compounding effect, right? And we'll see them combine to, to end up uh, yellowing the lawn, but typically pest damage seems to be a bit abnormal. Um, then I would start to go to these areas and examine the soil. So um, before we dive into that, let me take a step back and consider best practices. So from a prevention standpoint, Similar to uh, weed control, right? Our primary focus is ensuring that we're maximizing that turf density, um, maximizing the health of the, the turf to best be able to uh, respond to any pressure from pests, right? And so this translates to making sure that we're following that proper uh, water schedule, right? So we are following a deep and infrequent schedule in the summertime. If uh, we aren't receiving much natural precipitation, we are supplementing the lawn. Um, and in the spring and fall, we're not providing too much uh, water. Fertilizer will certainly help just to maintain that turf density. Along with that, the majority of um, or some of these plants follow MLSN guidelines, so minimum levels of sustainable nutrition guidelines. So essentially, providing what the grass needs, not more. Um, so with a conventional fertilization schedule, we're typically seeing a higher nitrogen load over the course of the season to really maximize uh, the growth rate. The downside is with the extra fertilizer, we tend to see an increase in uh, the amount of thatch buildup, right? So that, that uh, material in between the grass and the soil looks like sort of yellow grass um, built up. And that tends to be the perfect environment for uh, some turf pests to, to reside and also um, can run into potential disease concerns as well. So if we're able to make sure that we're not providing too much fertilizer uh, over the course of the season and not too much at one time, we'll be able to minimize uh, the chance of a, a pest being present. And finally, from a mowing perspective, making sure that we're uh, mowing at the proper height, not mowing um, too short. Some um, June beetles, for example, tend to lay their eggs in sparse areas of grass. So if we have thin areas of grass, that's where the eggs are laid, and then we see um, grubs. So uh, again, keep in mind that if we're able to maximize uh, the turf density and maintain that healthy lawn, we'll be able to, to control the majority of factors here, right? When we're looking to test for these pests, my first thought would be to go and see if the grass is still well rooted. So if you actually tug on the grass, uh, if it essentially comes up with very little resistance, it's a great sign that we could have a pest at play, uh, specifically grubs. So then I would be digging into the soil top couple of inches or so to see if we see any signs of grubs. Secondly, we can also consider a soapy wire flush test. So essentially mixing a bit of dish soap uh, with some wire to see if we drive anything else um, to the surface. Uh, we will be including a link to an article from our blog discussing how to complete this test. And then finally, there's the flood method, which is slightly different and primarily used uh, for chinch bugs. Like I said, for uh, the cool season lawns, I expect the most common pest to be grubs. So I'd really be digging into the soil, be my primary focus, and then follow that up with the, the soapy water flush test. And that will consider um, or account for the majority of turf pests. And then finally, from a repair perspective, like we said, we'll expand upon this in Thursday's webinar. But uh, as we get to this point in the season, right, right now, it's still a little bit earlier for the majority of the country, I would say, to, to be looking to repair the lawn. Uh, but as the temps start to drop, I would say consistently below roughly 80 degrees or so during the day, um, preferably, I would say in that 70 to 75 degree range or so during the day would be great if we had those temps for the following several weeks. Um, we can then consider getting grass seed down. So I would look to um, mow while bagging your clippings to contain a viable seed for right now, right? Then once the temps start to drop, we can 
spot treat as many of the desired weeds, uh, hand pull or dig out as many of the remaining weeds as, as desired, and then get some grass seed down, right? So when doing so, we'll prep the soil to make sure uh, that we're providing the optimal environment for the grass, considering why uh, this area needs to be reseeded, um, making sure that we're auditing the irrigation system is critical as well, just to make sure we're able to follow a short and frequent watering schedule when uh, we're seeding. So different from our watering recommendations for an established lawn, right? We want the, those grassroots aren't established yet, so we want to ma maintain that moist uh, environment while the seed is germinating. Um, in terms of actually repairing the areas, like we said, we'll expand upon this a bit more on Thursday's webinar, but remove any of that dead grass, loosen the soil up a bit so we can scuff the soil uh, a bit, and then add a little bit of topsoil on top of the seed, maybe a quarter of an inch thick or so, just to help increase moisture retention, keep that seed in place, and also to try to keep some of the birds and <laughs> other animals away. And finally, again, uh, uh, as we noted with the weeds and the pests, I'm sure you're all sick of hearing this at this point, <laughs> maintain that healthy space, right? If we're able to maintain that healthy lawn, make sure we stay on top of maintaining that turf density, we're going to be setting the lawn up for success in the long term. Well, y'all, it's been an honor having you guys here. Um, you know, if you want some more additional information, if there's anything that you just kind of want to read about, um, our blog, The Shed, has a lot of great resources. Again, we'll be sending some of those to you in the follow-up email. Um, but it's there to just kind of help you with any questions you might have. Um, if you watch these, if you don't get your question answered from the shed or here, you know, feel free to reach out to us at webinars that get Sunday. We'd be happy to chat with you, you know, figure out what's going on in your lawn. Um, and we do have all of these webinars listed on our YouTube channel. Um, there is a playlist specifically for the webinar. So if you just feel like sitting down on Saturday night and marathoning our faces, go right ahead. We'll be there to help you out. With that, I hope you all have a great rest of your day. I'm happy to chat with you. Perfect. All right. Have a great night, everybody. Hope we see you on Thursday. Take care. Take care, y'all. <laughs>